Hey guys, Graham and Chris here with you with another episode of Out of Left Field. Big show today, Adnan Verk going to be on the show at the tail end uh, of the show at the last half. We'll have him on talking about uh, hopefully some Clayton Kershaw today and the Major League Baseball uh, schedule for 2017, which was just released. But Chris, we have breaking news coming out of uh, San Diego tonight. Buster only reporting a suspension of San Diego Padres general manager A.J. Preller. Tell us what's going on, man. We do. This is only about two and a half hours old as of this recording. And Major League Baseball has released a statement that says, Major League Baseball has completed an investigation into the July 14th transaction in which pitcher Drew Pomeranz was traded from the San Diego Padres to the Boston Red Sox. Major League Baseball's Department of Investigations conducted the thorough review, which included interviews with relevant individuals from both clubs. The findings were submitted to Commissioner Robert D. Manfred, Jr. As a result of this matter, Major League Baseball announced today that A.J. Preller, Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Padres, has received a 30-day suspension without pay. I would like to caveat that the statement doesn't really say anything else. It doesn't say what he did. It doesn't say what the Padres did. It doesn't talk anything about the Colin Ray trade. It, it specifically mentions, mentions Pomeranz and just says that Preller is now suspended for 30 days without pay. Not that that's going to bother him. Well, this is pretty – I mean, this is really big news. A lot of this is unprecedented in the way that it was handled um, mainly by San Diego prior to all this. And we touched on this – uh, back when we were talking Paul Moran, when he came over, there was a concern about him with some elbow soreness, I believe it was. We noticed that he was really struggling with pitches, and he hasn't gotten much better. He's shown signs of brilliance, which is really what's kind of kept him in the bigs, but has really struggled in Boston. So this is uh, according to ESPN, and Buster only has a huge article on this. I actually had two articles. Uh, this is the final one with the suspension. According to multiple sources, this is what ESPN was told, Padres officials instructed their organization's athletic trainers to maintain two distinct files of medical information on their players, one for industry consumption and the other for internal use. So basically the way that, that this has been uh, described, and I've done some research in it, is there is basically one system that everything – medical, if you will, goes into, okay? Everyone, it's called the Sutton Medical System, and it's designed to basically maintain the privacy of the player but still be accessible to teams when needed, like for trades. Basically what we see most often, um, and anything that happens from a sore hamstring injury treatment, if you're given Tylenol, everything should be detailed in these records and then able to be seen by other teams when necessary. So trainers were told in meetings during spring training that the, that the distinction was meant to better position the team for trades. That's according to two sources with direct knowledge of what was said, as reported to Buster Olney. Like you said, man, this is huge. And Preller issued a statement and said, quote, I accept full responsibility for issues related to the oversight of our medical administration and record keeping. I want to emphasize that there was no malicious intent on the part of me or anyone on my staff to conceal information or disregard MLB's recommended guidelines. This has been a learning process for me. I will serve my punishment and look forward to being back on the job in 30 days. End quote. Chris, if we had the sound effects, I would be pushing the BS button right now. Absolutely, because let's not forget that A.J. Preller has been the center of controversy several times during his time in Major League Baseball. And according to Buster Olney, when Preller worked for the Rangers, he was suspended for violating baseball's rules regarding international signings. The Padres also were reprimanded by Major League Baseball shortly after Preller was hired because he conducted a workout that went against industry regulations, that according to NBC Sports. Um, so you can't, you can't look at something like this and say, oh, well, maybe he, maybe he didn't know, maybe he didn't do it on purpose. Maybe he was just saying, well, just put the important stuff in the, in the, in the files that go for, to each team for consumption and we'll keep the, the little stuff to ourselves. 
That's BS too, because every single thing that a player does, whether they go in to use a hot tub, whether they ask for aspirin, ibuprofen, an anti-inflammatory, every little thing goes into the Sutton Medical Database. Everything. And anytime they speak to a trainer and receive treatment, the details are noted of that visit. So it's not like this was just something, well, we're just gonna uh we're just gonna go ahead and put the most important information in the trade packet and we'll keep the minor stuff to ourselves. That's not what happened here. No, it was major stuff and we know that by, by Colin Ray's elbow issue which sent him back to San Diego, which I gotta be honest here, what I would have been extremely interested to see is if the Marlins had been forced to keep Colin Ray, if the Padres had not accepted him back, what would the, would the Marlins have escalated this to try and force the hand to get something in return to their, some type of compensation for what has been uh, described by at least three teams as, quote, strategic deception? Um, and uh, according to Buster, only at least one other team reached out to the commissioner's office with a complaint. Uh, we don't know who that was, and GM Dave Dombrowski of the Red Sox said that he cannot comment on this because it is an on- his was it's an ongoing MLB investigation, although MLB, after the suspension was handed down, considers the matter closed. Now, Padres' ownership, uh, they have multiple executives on their board, executive chairman Ron Fowler, managing partner Peter Seidler, and uh, CEO Mike D said the team will, quote, fully comply with Commissioner Manfred's recommendations pertaining to changes with our medical administration and record keeping, and they released this statement. Quote, rest assured we will leave no stone unturned in developing comprehensive processes to remediate this unintentional but inexcusable occurrence. To be clear, we believe that there was no intent on the part of A.J. Preller or other members of our baseball operations staff to mislead other clubs. We are obviously disappointed that we will lose AJ's services for 30 days, but we'll work closely with him upon his reinstatement to ensure that this unfortunate set of circumstances does not happen again, end quote. So well, we're, we're, we're getting the company line in this statement, which, which you had to expect, but you brought up a great point, and I want to get into this before we move on to um, the baseball schedule, is because – in the statement, he is also the executive vice president. I think our initial reaction, and probably most of our listeners, when they hear this, is going to be, he's gone. He's going to get fired. He's basically screwed his career at this point. No team is going to trust him again to make, to make a trade, you would think. But you brought up an interesting point of with the vice president uh, title. Does that possibly preclude San Diego from immediately firing him from his position? Or do we see them reassign him to a only VP role and bring in a new GM and strip him of that role? What do you think? Personally, I think that uh, they need to get the, the, the ownership board together, and they need to release Preller. I think that this sort, of, this sort of thing is something that they're not going to be able to get out from under as long as he is a member of the club. Uh, in related to the organization in any way, because as a GM, his, his ability to trade with other teams is now gone. Any, any sort of leverage or anything that he had to go into a room with another GM or get on the phone with another GM is now gone because that GM now has to be worried if he's going to be getting damaged goods for what he's giving in return. And as long as he's the executive vice president of the club, he still has the ability to continue practices that would make it difficult for the next GM to have any credibility with other teams as well. Because what they're going to say is, maybe not to the GM's face, but behind closed doors, what they're going to say is, well, you know, Preller's still calling the shots there. He might not be the GM, but he's the VP. He's still calling shots. I don't know if we can trust a trade like this, and it's going to sink the Padres. I agree. And, I mean, the Padres are already pretty much, uh, you know, they've been down in the dumps for a long time now. Uh, not, I wouldn't quite put them at dumpster fire, but this is getting them there. 
Um, the, the biggest concern, or I guess not concern, but what surprised me is he's been lauded by a lot of teams for what he's done to grow the Padres' uh, farm system. Now, the last thing I'll say on this, and, and this is kind of the interesting one, and I, I sincerely doubt that we're going to hear much more on this once we kind of turn the page. You know, I doubt that we'll even hear when he's reinstated because he'll be reinstated after the regular season ends. So we'll roll into next year, and it won't be much of a topic. But the caveat to this one, and this could be huge if, it, if anything else comes to pass, is that Preller's suspension was, was specific to the Pomeranz trade. But it does not mean that Major League Baseball can be precluded from pursuing other questions or other issues about uh, the Potter's actions should more develop. So if another team who has been wronged like this comes to Major League Baseball and files a complaint, then we could see another investigation done. And if that's proven to have a lot of veracity, could be really detrimental. Right. And we touched on something the last time that we talked about this, because we did talk about whether or not something was going to come of these allegations when we talked about the, uh, the Ray Castillo trade getting undone and Pomeranz issues with his elbow. Um, and you and I both said that it was a little bit weird that the Padres gave Castillo back when Ray was sent back to the Padres because they didn't have to do that because the trade had been finalized. Castillo was theirs. They could have kept him and accepted Ray back. Now, something might have had to happen as far as compensation, but now that we see all of this information coming out, to me it looks like they were really trying to get into a position where Miami wasn't going to press the issue of an investigation uh, into Colin Ray right. by giving Luis Castillo back. I got you. So, so basically, I guess the conspiracy theory, if you will, is that pretty much they kind of saw the, uh, the blood in the water. So to prevent the Marlins from taking this to the commissioner, we'll just go ahead, you know, like an etch sketch we'll just give it a shake, we'll give him back, you give him back, it never happened. Right. So, guys, we will keep you uh, updated on this. Should anything else arise, always you can check us out at OO Left Field on Twitter or Out of Left Field hosted by Graham and Chris on Facebook. Anything that happens up there, we'll always keep you updated. Plenty of questions getting into uh, our MVP discussions, which we will do in just about uh, 20 minutes here or so with Adnan Virk of ESPN. Again, very excited to have him on. I've uh, been waiting for this all week, so hoping you guys enjoy that. So as we move on from this, Chris, we are about three weeks to go in the Major League Baseball regular season. And guess what? The 2017 schedule was just released this week for next year. So April 4th is when the regular season will open. We get, about, we get three games. Uh, on the docket uh, that day should be uh, on the day that we're all all waiting for. And we're also going to get the fourth installment of the World Baseball Classic in March. Is it April, oh, April 2nd is, okay. April, April 2nd. April 2nd. Right. Okay, so April 2nd is, is the, uh, the first day, my nephew's birthday. So happy early birthday to you, Brady Wall. So the World Baseball Classic in March. Season begins April 2nd, as you said. And then we get 13 more opening games that Monday. So a nice, light three-game you know, three docket, something like it was this year, and we get really into it. And the beauty of, of the next year is the All-Star Games in my backyard down in Miami. They're going to try and get down there. And, of course, the Atlanta Braves open their new SunTrust uh, Stadium, which we discussed with Chip Carey back a few months ago. And, again, guys, check out Out of Left Field, hosted by Graham and Chris on Facebook for that interview with Chip Carey. So, now, what is the uh, what's the one that really you know stands out to you? Uh, looks like the Giants and the Diamondbacks are going to be one of those two games. So we get two divisional games with the Giants, Diamondbacks, and the Yankees and Rays on that Sunday opener. So, from what you've seen so far, you tell me what's popped to you. I know we've had a few things that we agree on. Be these. And, you know, Red Sox are going to open without David Ortiz for the first time in a long time. We're going to really begin to right. see a new face of baseball coming in. 
So what do you think, man? I mean, we're already talking about next season. We haven't even finished this one yet. Well, I'll tell you what I think. I think that the big deal next year is uh, is going to be something that you and I kind of agree we don't really like. We're, and that's going to be interleague matchups. Now, we don't like interleague matchups because you and I both grew up watching baseball when there was no interleague matchups. When the best team in the National League never saw anything of the best team in the American League except on tape until they got to the World Series. And I like it that way. You like it that way. We're both big fans of this idea that, that uh, these two teams should be fresh, so new to each other. what you're saying is we're old. What you're saying we're is old. we're old. Yes. Okay. We're old, hey, man. I'm, I'm cool, I'm cool with it. I just, I'm just going to kind of you know, quantify we're one, it here. We're, we're one rule change away from telling Major League Baseball to get off our lawns. <laughs> uh, but the interleague matchups next year are going to put the NL East against the NL Central, or excuse me, the AL East against the NL Central, the AL Central against the NL West, and the AL West against the NL East. That means Cubs, Red Sox, Cardinals, Yankees, Giants, Royals, Nationals, let's Angels. Go, yeah, so let's get into that one. Nationals, Angels. We're going to get to see Mike Trout and Bryce Harper take it head to head for a series. How's that? I mean,. I, you know, th- th- there is a, 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 a certain beauty to at least being able to watch two of the best, at least two of the most exciting players going head to head. And uh, you, like you said, a, a lot of the a lot of the big new new young faces really have been in the AL. How Altuve, Correa, Trout, all those guys. You know, Mookie Betts, Xander Bogarts, Jackie Bradley. I mean, hell, we got three guys on the Red Sox roster. So, you know, you haven't seen quite the same grab in the NL. We got Corey Seager. You get Trevor Story. You know, Nolan Arenado's blowing up, a little bit more of a veteran. But because they're so far west coast, a lot of the, you know, a good majority of your fans don't get to watch them a lot. So right. I'm excited for this. I just, to a point, wish, and I hope we see the Angels travel over to, to Washington as well to get those East Coast fans able to see this matchup in prime time. You know, I have to believe that's going to be an ESPN Sunday night game where that's what everyone's going to be watching is those two guys squaring off. At least that's my hope. Yeah, I think that that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, And I think it's going to be probably one of the top build games. I think that um, if, if things keep going the way they're going, uh, Cubs and Red Sox is going to be a big deal too. I think that yeah. everybody wants to see that matchup. Everybody wants to watch that before possible matchup in the World Series this season. And, and there's a possibility, uh, a good possibility from what I've heard, that Arietta may very well not be wearing um, that Cubs uniform next year. So, you know, could be a, a di- little bit of difference in the rotation, but we're going to see a lot of those names. We're going to see Schwarber back in the lineup uh, after yeah. that ACL is, is healed. We're still going to have Bryant and Rizzo. You know, Fowlers, I mean, all those guys are going to be raking. One thing I'm really excited about, and I'm already, you know, getting the savings account started for tickets. For the first time in six years, Saturday, June 10th, also in my backyard, two different directions, but hey, it all works out. The Tampa Bay Rays will host the Oakland Athletics, which, okay, that's not the first time it's happened in six years, but... It is going to be a single admission doubleheader, which that, as a baseball junkie, I'm stoked about because, hey, you pay, you pay one price, and, man, let's go, you know. Get, get the whole day, bring, bring, you know, bring the hot dogs, get the sodas, and, I mean, you're going to spend some money. But, I mean, two pro games, the price of one, you can't beat that. And I, that's something that I wish Major League Baseball would start scheduling more often. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and we haven't really touched on this, this is more of a personal thing, but, I, I feel that either the day that Ernie Banks came into the league or the date of his passing, which I believe was this year, may have been last year, that the Cubs should always, if, they can, if you can schedule them home on that date, should always play a day night doubleheader. Because what was Ernie Banks' – I mean, uh, you know, what was Mr. Cubs' most famous saying? Let's play two. So we have Jackie Robinson Day, which is on Saturday, April 15th. I think they should have a day for the Cubs to just play two. And you mentioned the Royals and the Giants. Uh, it'll be the first time the Royals have been in San Francisco 
since Game 5 of the World Series two years ago, which they obviously went 7 and, and lost and won uh, this past year. So, man, a, a lot of good stuff. I, I'm excited, like you said. Um, interleague, if it's, gonna, if it's a necessary evil, is going to be really, really exciting um, because I get the uh, – uh, I have the AL East. I mean, be, I, get, I get to see the Cubs play, which will be awesome, see the Cardinals as well. Um, so really, really stoked about that. So should be some good stuff. So yeah, yeah. A, a lot of a lot of anniversaries as well. We get Reggie Jackson's three homers and three swings. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the, kind of you know a lot of your, your your basic anniversary stuff. But you know, speaking of, of anniversaries and, and comebacks and, and a reminder of things, man, we finally uh, get to see Clinton Kershaw back on the hill. Talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Um, we, we and I both watched the game Friday. He pitched again this past Wednesday. Two games in, eight total innings. You know, lost the first game, which, to be honest, wasn't a bad game by him, and then pitched five innings of one-hit baseball against a surging Yankees team. I mean, they really are, that's what, two and a half out of the wild card now, so that wild card in the AL is still wide open, as is the AL East, so... What were your thoughts on Kershaw? Obviously, unbiased because you're a Giants homer. What were your thoughts on uh, on Clayton Kershaw being back on the hill? And really, I mean, he looked a little rusty, but was still looking good for all intents and purposes, it being a rehab start because minor league baseball is over and you can't rehab him down there anymore. Right. So, you know, like like you said, we both watched the game against Miami, and uh, it wasn't a bad start he only went three innings because he was only allotted 70 or 80 pitches so for him to go three maybe 80 70 or 80 pitches or i think he went 65 in three innings not great 66 yeah you're right there 66 and 64 respectively uh, on the last two starts right um and and you can see 64 innings he went five full innings in this last start obviously much more his dominant self uh than the previous one in the previous one, he gave up two earned runs quick, but like we said, that home run that he gave up to Rio Muto is not a mistake that Kershaw made. That's something that Rio Muto put a good piece of hitting on. And yeah, it was a great. I mean, it was a great cut fastball down in the zone, and Rio Muto has really shown his growth in being able to explode out of the bottom of the zone and took a yard on the. I think it was a, it was the uh, first at bat of the game, which was yeah, kind of a rough welcome, kind of a rough welcome back for Kershaw. Well, you know, sometimes you need a rough welcome back to get you back into the groove. And uh, but Kershaw recorded five strikeouts in that three innings, which is huge. Um, he recorded five strikeouts in his most recent start, which is again huge. Now that the five strikeouts that he recorded in Miami on a night when Fernandez pitched incredibly well, struck out 14. Uh, so, I mean, there's really nothing you're going to do about taking the loss in, 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 a, in a great pitching outing from Fernandez like that. But he, he struck out five and becomes, becomes a guy who now has 150 strikeouts and only 11 walks, which, yeah, he sat for a couple months, but, and, and that's to, still an incredible and, stat. And to your point, in both these last two starts, he hasn't walked anyone. So, I mean, even being as rusty as he was, and, and he was miss I mean, there's no doubt he was missing the zone. Um, and, and that was one of the biggest things that I noticed is uh, the first inning he was just north, south, east, and west. He was kind of all over the place. Tended to miss up a decent amount, actually, um, the second run that he got, which kind of was – uh, the hard part is he wouldn't have needed the loss had Glovely, uh, or Glovely, wow, had Utley gloved uh, that line drive. It just tipped off the top of the laces, but he hung a curveball and it got set back up the middle, and that was run number two, and he got the loss. Um, right. You mentioned the home run of Real Muto. was very impressed with that, that pitch. It was a great pitch. He ran some of his movement back into the heart of the plate, got himself hurt, and breaking ball was a little bit it off. Um, he was either missing low and bouncing it or hanging it. Right. But turn around and look at this this uh, outing that he had against the Yankees and 
a lot of those worries that people had watching that Marlins game kind of went away for him. He, uh, he did really well. He had a really good command. Um, he did have to take a break in the fourth inning after a rain delay, which kind of scared everybody, but it was only about 10 minutes, uh, nine or 10 minutes. But, you know, I mean, he pitched four incredible innings and gave up one hit and had showed the old command of Kershaw, showed the old speed of Kershaw. And, you know, Giants fan or no Giants fan, I, I think Kershaw might be back for October and to his old self. And that's a scary thought. Without a doubt. I mean, we've talked about just how good – the Dodgers have, have managed to be, and unfortunately I think our NL West pick is probably going to be wrong. Um, I mean, the the, the Giants really um, – I, I don't see them coming back from the, the four or five game deficit that they were in. Um, you know, they have some easy games. They had the Padres a couple of times, but they also have to face the Dodgers right now and the Cardinals, and then the Dodgers I think six more times. So, yeah, I, I – with him back in the form that he's been in, Orias has pitched well. They said Maeda. They've got it going on. Um, and with Corey Seager, like we said, winning that Rookie of the Year, uh, which we think is going to be a good possibility that he's going to win, or a good possibility that he could be in the discussions for MVP, which we will discuss the ad man work coming up. Mm-hmm. They've definitely, I think, got a, a stranglehold on that division. Yeah. Hey, guys. Speaking of talking to Adnan Vert coming up. We're going to take a short break, just a couple of minutes. And when we get back, we're going to have Adnan Verk from ESPN and from the Cinephile podcast, which all of you should go check out because it's really great. All right. So this is Chris and Graham from Out of Left Field, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Hey, guys. Graham here from Out of Left Field. Less than three weeks remain in the baseball regular season, but college football and the NFL have just kicked off. At thegruelingtruth.net, you can get all your football questions answered and your thirst for knowledge quenched. Joe Pritchard and Aaron Zepnick go in-depth each week into the Green Bay Packers on the Title Town Huddle Show and check out Steelers Weekly, Bengals Weekly, and Rams Weekly. Plus, Big Ten Football, Tony Hunter gets into everything Golden Domers on Irish Football Weekly, don't forget also, check out your fantasy football predictions each week. Figure out who to sit, who to play, and everything else in between. All that and more at thegruelingtruth.net, The Grueling Truth on Facebook, and at Grueling Truth on Twitter. The Grueling Truth, where legends speak. Hey guys, we're back at Adelaide Field. Very uh, excited to have Baseball Tonight host and cinephile movie podcast host Adnan Burke joining us. Adnan, again, thank you for being here. Really great talking to you today. Well, thank you, fellas. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, clearly, I've been bit by the podcast bug. Now that I have my own, I feel like I, uh, at the very least, can pay it forward. So when you guys ask me to come on, it's the least I can do. I hope we can all continue the podcast revolution. Definitely. Well, tell us about cinephile. I know you're a huge movie buff, uh, and you see movies a lot more in depth than, than I know I ever have, and uh, I believe your Oscar picks were something in like the 80 or 90 percent accurate uh, this year. So, tell us how it's going. I know a, a lot of it got the start on Mike and Mike, and now you're really kind of holding your own and, uh, and and getting a lot of the stuff out there every week. No, I appreciate the kind words. It is uh, it's definitely a labor of love, and it's something where you know once you kind of find your rhythm, uh, I think everything else follows suit. Like I've always been a movie geek. It's always been something that's a big part of my life and, and growing up I wanted to be a director I wanted to be uh, Martin Scorsese and I loved the movies of Al Pacino and Robert De Niro and those movies of the 70s and I kind of you know a lot of my film education was self-taught in that you know I would just kind of you go down the wormhole and you just keep digging and finding out more and more so you you start watching Mean Streets and Taxi Driver and Raising Bull and you know man these movies are incredible and then oh what were Scorsese's influences oh it was John Ford and it was Fellini and it was Kurosawa so then you start watching those movies, and you're watching the foreign films, and you're watching stuff from the 50s. And, and my mom used to always joke, she didn't like any movies with the swearing or nudity or profanity. So I said, well, that canceled pretty much everything that's modern day. So that helped, <laughs> in, watch, and that helped in watching old movies, because it was like, all right. And it wasn't like, like I, I have no interest in musicals and such. Like I've never seen 
Guys and Dolls and West Side Story, but I love those old gangster movies. So I would watch Humphrey Bogart movies with her and James Cagney and uh, the great Robert Mitchell and all those sorts of movies. So that was all helping my film education visually. And um, this is when I was in high school. And then uh, reading a ton. I read a lot of Roger Ebert. And, of course, Cisco Ebert was a great TV show. But Ebert was a Pulitzer Prize winning film critic. And he was amazing. I would read his yearbooks and his essays and, and learn so much more about film and how to watch it critically from a critical perspective. Um, and when I went to school, you know, I wanted to be a film major, but there's just no way my parents would have uh, sanctioned paying all that money towards uh, film education. But I figured by going into radio and television arts at Ryerson, uh, which is a school in downtown Toronto, which is known for broadcasting, I said, well, I can just segue. I'll do what Robert Altman did. He was a TV director, then he became a film director. And even on the first day of class, we went around the room, what are you going to do one day? And I said, I'm going to be a director. Now, unfortunately, I realized after I did my first short film, I didn't have a very good visual sense. I just didn't think in that manner. Like if guys like Scorsese and Coppola and Lucas and Spielberg, you know, they think visually. They, they look at a scene, they're storyboarding it, and they're picturing where the camera goes and the moves. And I just, I can't do that. So, you know, I'm a verbal guy, and I love to read. I love to write and speak. And so I realized, you know, broadcasting was a better fit for me. And I, I love writing, but I, again, I, as a scriptwriter, I wasn't original enough. I didn't think I had enough ideas. So the natural, I said, well, I love sports, so it's great to be a sportscaster. So movies and sports are my two passions. Let's do that. But I always wanted to somehow tap into that film education and that background, that passion, that love. And so what happened was I've been at ESPN for six years now. I've been sitting on the radio for four years. And all credit to my buddy Ryan Rosillo, who would see my tweets and would start laughing. Like, who, who the hell is this? Like, Van Pelt used to laugh at my way, Wolf of Wall Street <laughs> review because I call it the, a dizzying comic opera. And he goes, what, what, what is this? Where are you coming from? So then they realized that, you know, I really am, am into this. And, and, you know, they would mock me and say it's um, highbrow or I'm a movie snob. But, but other people said, no, I think he's cerebral. I think he's smart. He clearly knows what he's talking about. I like his taste in movies. And so it would become a segment when I would fill in on the show. We'd always, all right, I'm going to talk movies, so what do you got? And they would, you know, let me indulge in stuff that, you know, some stuff that is mainstream, let's say like Mad Max Fury Row, which I loved, and then sometimes Ryan would go, all right, give me some indie movie that only geeks like you are watching, and I'd tell them. And, again, it started to build, and then, like you said, on Mike and Mike, uh, Grady and Golok were aware of this, so they let me give a little more. And then come Oscar time, there's a website called Gold Derby. They're the number one prognosticating site when it comes to this kind of thing. And they had said to me, hey, we hear you all the time on the radio. And we're like, you're one of us. Like, you're clearly in this entertainment world just like we are. So you need to be a part of this. So now I'm actually one of the experts' picks on goldderby.com. Like, you've got, you know, celebrated critics here from Rolling Stone and Variety and Entertainment Weekly. And then there's me from ESPN representing. So I've got my Emmy picks up there for this weekend. And, of course, as you mentioned, the Oscar picks, which I did very well last year so. All of this led to the fact that I've been frustrated that I haven't had my own show. And I've, I've bugged the ESPN suits and said, why can't I get my own radio show? Like, I've been filling in for four years now. And the answer's always been, listen, you know, it's not that we think you can't do it. It's just that you're too valuable to the TV side with my college football work and baseball and, and college basketball and previously filling in on Oberman and Sports Center. So, you know, you can't do both. You'll lose your mind, which I agree with. I have a young family. I don't want to do both. I don't want to work 80 hours a week. But that's what I thought about Cinephile. I said, well, you know what? If you won't give me my own radio show, so I can't just talk about ways with Ever, maybe I should do a podcast. So my brother is a big fan of fantasy focus, uh, the fantasy football podcast, Matthew Berry and Field Yates. And, and when he came to visit, he said, I want to meet those guys, and maybe let's go sit in on one of their podcasts. And I watched them do it, fellas, and I don't know how it was for you, but I said, well, this looks pretty easy. You just sit down in front of the mic and just start talking, whereas on TV and radio, I've got to do all this prep work here. They just go and bang it out. That's about it. There's no frills. You can go whatever no, key tours you want. And no makeup. Yeah, no makeup, exactly. I don't have to dress up. I just show up and just talk. So I said, well, this is pretty good. Uh, why don't I try to do this with Cinephile? And Dan Stanzik is a good buddy of mine. Um, you know, he was willing to do it for free, as was I. I mean, that's the big lesson in all of this, by the way. If you tell your employer I'll do it for free, oh, right, no problem. Great. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's kind of how so, we got started. We, yeah, we got I, asked, like, sure, let's, let's do it. Right. I just needed the real estate. Like, can you just put me on the ESPN page and I'll do it for free and Dan will do it for free and we'll just, I'll watch the movies I normally would and just go to the theater as I would and I'll tweet up my reviews and, and then just talk about it and hopefully we can get some people on. And so it's been a real labor of love. It's a ton of fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's the thing I most look forward to. I probably shouldn't admit that, but it's, it's what I'm most passionate about right now. What am I going to do on some of the movies I'm going to talk about? What actors are we trying to book? And the huge breakthrough was getting De Niro, who, as I mentioned earlier, is one of my heroes. Like, it's, it's Pacino, De Niro, and Scorsese, and that's uh, my holy trinity. So the fact that, that Bob actually came on the podcast and came to ESPN, and we had a real connection and a, 
a terrific conversation, and uh, it, it's stunning to me. It is, it is surreal. And those that know me, like my close friends and, and buddies who have known me for years, they were like, you don't understand. Like, I'm sure your coworkers are like, oh, cool, Robert De Niro came to ESPN, I then got the interview him. He's like, but we know. Like, this isn't just a career highlight. Like, I, you know, I've been to the World Series. I've, I've interviewed Roger Federer, Tiger Woods, Mario Rivera, Derek Jeter, Wayne Gretzky, like, you name it. But this is, like, easily a career highlight. And it is a life highlight. Like, this is, this is up there with the birth of my children. Like, it is, it's astounding to me that it's happened. So I'm, uh, I'm grateful to the whole podcast concept and the fact that ESPN has let me do it. If, if tomorrow they said, listen, Cinephile has been a good run, but we just don't think it's doing well, uh, see you later. I'd be like, okay, well, I, I definitely got a lot out of it. But thanks that the numbers have been good. So I appreciate all those that are listening and subscribing because that's the key. Well, definitely, uh, it, that's how we feel having you on. We're, again, thrilled to have you on, guys. Uh, Adnan Verk on here with us. You can follow him on Twitter, at Adnan ESPN. Check out the uh, ESPN uh, app. Look on the find Cinephile. at C-I-N-E-P-H-I-L-E. Follow his podcast for all the latest movies, his ideas, his thoughts. Uh, but the beauty of that, the beauty of sports, is that a lot of times it's like a movie, but it's live and you, it's never really scripted. And recently, your colleague Buster only presented 10 Ideas to Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred on how to improve baseball. And it got a lot of thoughts from both sides of the aisles of does baseball need to be improved, people need to just appreciate what it was. But one of the, the thrills for us is one of the ideas actually came from us uh, here on the show. Uh, we sent it in, Greeny read it, he and Buster were, uh, were co-hosting, he was in for Golick, and it was the idea of requiring relief pitchers to face a minimum of two batters. It, it helps, the specialist thing has taken over so much to, started to drag the games out. Do you think that would be a rule that would help the game, or do you have ideas that maybe baseball can be improved? Uh, I think that's an excellent idea. I remember hearing Buster and, and Greeny mention that, and that's an enormous issue, that the game has just become so specialized now, and, you know, full blame or credit, if you want to say that, to Tony LaRusso with the way he did with the A's bullpen and, and making actually just a ninth-inning guy, and then the Royals have taken it to a new level these last few years with all the mixing and matching, and, and the best managers do it. You know, the Buck Showalters and, and Joe Maddens and Bruce Bochy. There's a reason those guys are so great at managing the bullpen because they know that, you know, I can bring in a guy just for one batter or I can bring him in for a couple innings or whatever it is. I know how to uh, maximize whatever I have in the pen. But there's no doubt it slowed the game down. I mean, I... I I hate it, to be perfectly frank. You know, I miss the days when the guys just went for seven and then, you know, maybe an eighth inning guy to close, and that's about it. Now, with all the warm-ups and the guy comes in, and, and I hate visits to the mail. That's why I get rid of I would definitely get rid of any time a pitching coach goes to the mound or the players huddle in. Like, I have no time for any of that. Like, I would just, okay, the manager wants to make a pitching change, just motion to the pen and boom, just get that guy out of there and get the next guy in here, and that's it. Let's go. And don't even, the warm-up toxins, you don't need that. You already warmed up with the pen. Like, let's go. First pitch, and that's what matters. Uh, so I love that concept from them because it definitely slowed it down. The fact that that guy can come in and just face one batter than go really bogs the game down. Um, a couple of years ago, we were lucky. Baseball started to get a little quicker. It was about 12 minutes shorter in the Manfred's first year, but now it's back over three hours again. So I do think some changes need to be made because there is um, a young generation now that isn't as into baseball as it was when the, the three of us were young and growing up. So I, I miss those days. So would, would trying another idea and something that, that Joe Girardi came out and express his displeasure, although he takes full advantage of it, as, as all managers do, it is the whole idea of expanding the rosters and doing it in a time when, I mean, really teams are fighting for that second wild card spot and fighting for maybe a division lead. And, you know, you, you're starting to see teams who, say, for example, the Giants are playing the Padres. The Padres have no, have no interest in the rest of the season aside from seeing what their guys, you know, that they have in, in the minors – can produce from spring training up to now. So a team like the Giants who are chasing the Dodgers, um, you know, and are playing the Padres, it, it, it really gives almost an unfair advantage, if you will, to, you know, to teams that, that are facing guys like the Braves and the Twins. Is there a way that, that Major League Baseball could, could fix this or do it earlier in the season and then cut it back down to normal rosters when it gets to September? Yeah, I don't know if there is an easy answer, fellas, because you're right. It, it's frustrating to see it, and yet, I mean, I get it. This is just the way they've always done it with the 40-man rosters and guys get expanded. But, but you're right. For those teams that are out of it, it's incredibly annoying because you're right. Like, who cares what's happening for the Padres right now? Like, they're, they're bringing in guys to, to stretch them out and see whether or not they can play at the major league level. But you're right. For the majority of us, it's like, honestly, who gives a damn? Like, we don't just get the game going. But I, 
But I, there is no easy answer because from San Diego's perspective, well, what do you want them to do? Like not bring up these prospects, not give them you know, what could be viable at bats and a little bit of um, time to acclimate to the majors rather than everybody always starting opening day and starting fresh. Like that's not fair to them either. So, again, no easy answer to that one, but I share people's frustration because – those 40-man rosters do definitely bog down games, and especially with teams that are out of it, you just get annoyed watching it. You know, I have a question about contracts in, in Major League Baseball, actually. The Nationals paid a huge amount of money to Steven Strasburg, but no amount of money that, that, that they pay him is going to keep his right elbow healthy. I mean, <laughs> was that a mistake, signing him to an extension? I mean, do you think Major League Baseball is ever going to be able to bring pressure to the bargaining table to get rid of fully guaranteed contracts like that? That'll never happen. The Strasburg specifically, I think, was a mistake. And you can check the tape, <laughs> not to be that guy, but if you go back to baseball tonight, everybody was raving about it. I remember I was with Aaron Boone. I can't remember who else. I want to say Kirkjian. It was definitely Boone. He was loving it. And I didn't you know, want to play devil's advocate, but I honestly did feel that way. I said, I'm surprised you guys are so all in on this. Like, he has a clear history of being injured all the time. Like, he's... He's had Tommy John. He's never thrown 200 innings in a single season. You know, all you guys are going, yeah, fantastic signing for the Nationals. Way to go, $175 million. Smart move. And I'm going, smart move. Like, he could get injured again. Like, I, I'd like to see a little more. And their reasoning was, listen, he was going to be the best free agent pitcher out there. So if the Nationals didn't give it to him, somebody else would. Okay, I get that. But just because there's going to be a mistake made doesn't mean you have to make the mistake. Like, let somebody else overpay for him and see you later. <laughs> Uh, they said the window's, the window's small right now. Okay, the Nationals are in first in the East, so go for it now. Again, that has nothing to do with the contract. You don't have to pay him right now. Like, yeah, okay, if the window's small, go out there and win a World Series and then give him the contract. But their point was if you go to the open market, he's going to get you know, turned off by that and spurned by that, so he's just going to, out of spite, sign somewhere else. And I'm like, really? Like, if, if a player's that bitter, like I've, I've signed him to my organization. Washington's put faith in him and dealt with him over injuries and whatnot, just because we don't send him to an extension before he signs his deal, he's going to be that bitter that no matter what he's going to leave? Well, then I don't want that kind of guy on my team anyways. I'm like, all right, well, let's see it. So I it, thought it was a bad signing. I, I looked at that. I go, seven years, 175 for a guy who's never thrown two hard innings and always gets hurt? No thanks. Hmm. And, and one of the uh, things so, that we discussed in, in our Saw Young discussion last week is that he, if he is even able to come back from the flexor mass strain this year, It'll only be his second postseason start in the, what, seven or eight years of his current Major League career? Yeah, like that's crazy. And, and again, Booney's point and the rest of the guys, who I was, Timmy, I think, whoever else is on baseball tonight kept saying, yeah, but with him and Scherzer, it's a formidable one, two, and starting pitching so valuable. And I'm like, well, no, I, I go the other way. I go, pitching's never been better now. So I trust my scouts and prospects and whoever else that I can, I can go get another Steven Strasburg. Like, I get the fact he has electric stuff, and when healthy, he's one of the best pitchers in the game, but he's never been totally healthy. He's never had a top-to-bottom year like a Madison Bumgarner or a Felix Hernandez or any of these other so-called aces that you've associated with the game the last five or ten years. Throw in in 2011, like Strasburg's never had that year, so I, I don't think he was worthy of getting paid that money. I just thought it was premature. I thought, it, I thought if he stayed healthy this year, fellas, and pitched two or twenty innings, and the Nationals you know, made the World Series. That by all means, go ahead, give him two hundred million dollars, and just hope that his arm doesn't fall off. But the fact that they did it before it even got close to the end of the season, I thought was a mistake. And, and I, I don't root for anybody's uh, ill will or undoing, but I do feel vindicated in being critical of the time that now Strasburg's hurt again and may not return. Yeah, I agree. Great stuff here. We're here with Adnan Verk on Out of Left Field. Follow him at Adnan ESPN on Twitter. Follow us at OO Left Field on Twitter and also out of Left Field hosted by Graham and Chris on Facebook. Now this is the kind of the, I guess, the biggest question that, that we're going to ask. Um, sports has always been a place where issues can be brought to a bigger stage for players to make a statement as to their feelings about social injustices or other events happening in the world. Now recently, center fielder Adam Jones, Baltimore Orioles, about MLB players not participating in the protest. And he said, in part, we have two strikes against us already, so you might as well not kick, off, kick yourself out of the game. In football, you can't kick them out. You need those players. In baseball, they don't need us. Baseball is a white man's sport. He, referring to Kaepernick, is not disrespecting the military. What he's doing is showing that he doesn't like the social injustice that the flag represents. 
He went on to say the outside world doesn't really respect athletes unless they talk about what they want them to talk about. Society doesn't think we deserve the right to have an opinion on social issues, end quote. So, Adnan, Chris and I both were in the U.S. Army. We understand the right to take a stand by not standing. We get what players in the NFL, other, other you know, sports are doing. But what are your thoughts on Adam Jones' comments, specifically in baseball? Did he go too far saying it was a white man's sport and lose a lot of focus on what the message was supposed to be? I don't think so, but I think that, that I mean, you're right in that, that line stands out. What you just said, most of that you listen to, you nod your head, just go, uh-huh, uh-huh, to point to point. That line sounds tinged with, with being a little bit too overwrought, like a white man's sport. Like, well, what, what is that supposed to say? It sounds like there's a negative connotation there. He's trying to say uh, more than what he's trying to say. But I think actually he doesn't make sense because it is a white man's sport and that the majority of players are white. Um, you know, the players that have been the influx the last decade have been the Latino players. Uh, there's never been fewer black players now in the majors. You know, it was 26%, whatever it was, in 1985, one in four. And now it's around 10%. Single digits is always going down, unfortunately, and it's not, it doesn't look like it's going to recover anytime soon. Um, I think his overriding point is true in that if it's a sport with a dominant amount of blacks, then you're going to have more support. If it had been LeBron James being with the NBA where 80% of the players are African-American, then there would have been widespread support. In the NFL, it's 67%, so two-thirds of the players are black. You're not going to have as much negativity. Whereas in a sport like baseball or you know hockey or NASCAR or golf, I think there would have been a lot more antagonism. And that's not to say Cap's been overwhelmingly praised for this. He is still hearing the booze when he's on the field. There are plenty of critics and people who are saying stuff about him. But I think it's going easier than if it was in baseball or hockey or NASCAR. Like Dan Lapter made a great point. He was laughing about Tortorella, the head coach for USA World Hockey, saying that, you know, if any of my players don't stand for the anthem, they'll be sitting the entire game. Well, you think going to be a big tough guy in a sport like hockey. There are no uh, players of color you know, in the sport that are, that are noteworthy. You've got maybe 10 guys in all sports. Like, it's easy to be a tough guy in a sport where it is predominantly white. Um, so, and, I, and more to the point, I don't think Tornarelli really understands, again, what civil rights is about, what Kaepernick's standing up for, what he believes is actually active. But that's a separate conversation. As for Adam Jones, I like the fact that he speaks his mind. He's outspoken. He's brash. He's one of the few black players currently in the game who are superstars, who's a legit guy that, that kids can look up to and try to emulate not only on and off the field. And I think a lot of what he said had truth in it. Does that one line stick out a little bit? You kind of rub you the wrong way and you go, uh, I wish you didn't just say baseball's a white man's sport because it makes it sound like a negative connotation. Maybe. But I think if you read the entire statement as you did correctly, then I think you go, all right, there's a lot of truth in what this guy's saying. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and just to go along with what you were just saying, I think that um, this is sort of the, the, the dialogue that, professional sports needs to have with society. And I think that if you read the statement it's in, in its entirety, instead of just picking on that one line, I think that you can see that he's trying to have a dialogue with society and he's trying to make a point that, Hey, this is a problem. This is something that needs to be taken care of. Totally. Chris. I, th- I think and that's the thing. If, if, if the next line had been, if it's just from baseball as a white man's sport and the white man doesn't care, then you go, hang on a second, where are we going with it? Or, or white people don't care about black people's problems, and, which is the way you feel like. When you just have the one statement, you go, okay, what's the follow-up to that? Is it be something negative? But no, he's just stating a fact. Baseball is primarily played by white men. And if you want to think that he's, he's saying that in a negative fashion, he's done. I think that's a very plain-spoken truth. Um, and you're right. I think Adam Jones is going to try to get the dialogue going. And I'll say this about Kaepernick. When he first didn't stand, I said, oh, boy, he's going to be in trouble. Uh, and thanks to both you guys for, for serving in the Army. And, I, and that was my first thought. was like a military personnel going, hang on a second. We fight and die for the flag and for our freedoms. And this guy can't stand up to respect it just because he's upset about police brutality. Like, these, these are separate issues. But I have been pleasantly surprised by all the military personnel, uh, yourselves included, who have said, listen, just because we fought uh, for our country and have served and defended, uh, that doesn't mean that we get angry when somebody has an issue with the government. That's why you fight. That's why we have these freedoms. And if you do want to challenge what the U.S. government says or does or the way things are, you have that right. Um, exactly. And at first, I, I said to myself, well, I personally wouldn't, I'm Canadian, so it is different. But I, mean, I would never, I can't think of a, a, a situation where I wouldn't stand with the Canadian anthem is being played or the flag is there. But I certainly respect the right. If I was at a ball game and my buddy goes, you know what, I don't like uh, Canadians are forced to check or pass when it comes to dealing with, with natives. If a buddy of mine said to me, you know what, I don't like the way natives have been treated in this country. I'm not standing for the anthem. 
I wouldn't pick a fight with the guy. I'd be like, all right, well, I'm always going to stand. I'm a proud Canadian. I'm proud of my country. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't get in the guy's face. I'd say, well, that, that is your right to do what you want. And for Kaepernick, again, I, I personally would always stand for the anthem. If I'm an American, I would always stand. But I totally am with him that there are fractured relations between blacks and whites in this country, that police brutality is a serious issue. He has the right to, to give whatever sign of protest he wants to. And I think I'm, I'm coming around at him more the longer it's gone. Like when he first did it, like I said, I go, uh, I'm apprehensive about this. He's going to get smoked. And I did not care for the fact he rolled those socks of pigs on them, I said, which is a complete stereotype, which is a complete cheap shot at all the cops who are doing their job and are good citizens and are deserving of our respect in this country. You, you know, how upset would Colin Kaepernick be if a cop was walking around wearing socks of black thugs? You know, that's clearly patently unfair and untrue. But I think Cap did a good job of overcoming that. And said, listen, that was my bad. That was my story. You know, that was before the protest. Uh, it was a bad look. And since then, you know, Trent Dilfer criticized him. He's a teammate of mine. I love Trent. He's a good guy. But I disagree with what he said about Kaepernick. I just saw what Kaepernick had to say today. I thought he was forthright. I thought he was uh, very candid and intelligent. So I think he's actually, um, I think he's done a good job with this. I just wish he played better quarterback, but that's a separate issue. Kind of thing. <laughs> As a 49ers fan, I completely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> So that's obviously a really deep subject, and we could probably go on about it for hours if we really wanted to. But um, I, know, I know we're all on a little bit of a time crunch here. I'm a student at ASU, and I have a class in about 25 minutes. Um, so for our last question of the day, I'd like to really just kind of serve you up a meatball. Um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been breaking down end-of-the-year awards. We started with Rookie of the Year a couple of weeks ago. We did Cy Young last week. We're going to do MVP this week. Um, and Graham and I – both agreed that Corey Seager and Michael Fulmer are probably the AL and NL rookies of the year. I mean, Corey Seager's having an amazing year. Unfortunately yep. for, the, for, for the Mariners, his brother doesn't play quite as well as he does. Um, <laughs> With a $100 million contract. Right. Uh, and Michael Fulmer, I mean, the guy stepped in for, for Verlander, of all people, and got the job done. Um, so I think he's probably a shoe in there, too. Uh, Cy Young, we both agreed on Rick Porcello in the American League. Uh, we, really? we differed a little That's bit. Interesting. We differed a little bit in the National League. Okay. Graham has Max Scherzer winning it. I have Madison Bumgarner winning it. But both of us agree that neither of us would be surprised if the outcome were opposite of what we thought. Um, I uh, tried to jump in. I completely agree, you guys. No. Homer and Seager are hands down. Uh, Al, I'm surprised both of you guys are going for He has been really good, but I maybe it's just my Homerism as a Blue Jays fan. I was leaning Aaron Sanchez before he got <laughs> roughed up against the Red Sox on Sunday. Uh, mm-hmm. But I would almost throw Fulmer in that conversation for Cy Young as well because of how good he's been. Uh, the right. NL Cy Young, you guys are right. That's more wide open. Alex Cora was on Scherzer a month ago. I said, well, he's here, he's not as high as the other guys. But he pointed out the numbers with the stack he's love, which is his whip, his strikeouts per nine, his durability. So when you look at those other numbers, Scherzer's pretty good. So I hear what uh, I think Brendan was saying. But Chris, for you, mm-hmm. bad bum. That was my pick as well. Hasn't been as good lately. I'd throw in Hendricks. I mean, this guy's got a sub-2 ERA. I'd go with Hendricks sure. right now personally. Sure. And, and we, the crazy we, thing is that Max Scherzer for a while was the dark horse. Strasburg yeah. was, I mean, the premier guy because he was starting 13-0, and 0, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get the two DL stints back-to-back, and now Scherzer all of a sudden, you know, you're reminded that, oh, yeah, by the way, the guy threw two no-hitters, and he's still pitching. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's weird how it's changed because Strasburg, even at one point, we were joking, we're like, well, wins are overvalued now. Like, if you're, say, for attrition, you believe the stats, you go, well, who cares if he's 13 Look at the other numbers. So then, you know, these old school guys with John Cruck and Wick Suck would laugh at us and go, well, what are you, what are you guys talking about? I said, the last time I checked, baseball, he's supposed to win the game. The guy's 13 0. Let's go. So I think Porcello will certainly be helped by that sentiment because of the fact he's uh, been so good with racking up the wins for the Red Sox. But I, I think it's more wide open. I'm, I'm with you guys. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, so, and I so think, this I think for, to your point that to your point that makes a lot of sense with Arietta and Lester because Lester's had a, had one of the probably the best year of his career where he's pitching you know over twenty five thirty games, but because of how good the Cubs actually are playing this year, he hasn't had to go as deep in games, which has been great, but it's also kind of held his numbers back a little bit. You know, when you're looking at you know two hundred strikeouts or you know. 17, 18, 19 wins. So it's, it can be good and it can be bad. But good for the team, but can be bad for the individual. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. It's tricky how that happens sometimes, that you can have great numbers and the wins, and all of a sudden it gets held against you. It's, it's all different math that other people are using to evaluate the winners, which I think ultimately is a good thing. You should use as much data as you have. So this week, like I said, we're doing the MVP, and we thought that we would wait until we had you on so we could discuss it with you. Um, right now, Chris Bryant looks like 
he is going to uh, he's going to take the National League MVP. I think that um, batting just around 300, 37 home runs, 94 RBI, and a 956 OPS. But I mean, Daniel Murphy's tearing the league up, and you can't count him out. And in my opinion, I think for a guy who's hitting 319 and uh, an OPS of 911 in Corey Seager, even though he's probably a shoe in for, for Rookie of the Year, you've got to add him into that conversation for MVP as well. You guys got to get Alex Cora on this podcast because AC also said in late July, look out for Seager. He said, if the Dodgers win the division, then Seager should win MVP. And I said, hang on a second, it's Brian's to lose. And his point was, as further apply to what you guys are saying, he goes, LA, are you kidding me? They've lost Pershaw. They have all these injuries to their starting staff, and their offense has been rather herky jerky until this last month and a half or so. Because Agon was having a down year. You know, Ether obviously was completely gone. Um, Puig is a no show. It's sent to the minors. He goes, like, Seager's been their most consistent offensive player, and he's just a kid. He goes, like, he has to be in the MVP conversation if they beat the Giants and win the division. So I'm with you on that one. I'd go with Bryant. He's number one in war, along with the yeah. offensive numbers you mentioned the Cubs are the best team in baseball he's excellent defensively runs the bases like he's tremendous Rizzo is actually my pick at the start of the year I still think he's gonna be top five and some love for my Canadian Joey Votto who since late June has like over a 500 on base which is ridiculous like anybody who goes <laughs> north of 500 OBP is awesome but of course yeah. the Reds are terrible he's not really gonna get much love the American League, I kept saying Donaldson, and Dallas Braden kept mocking me, but I, the last two weeks, Donaldson's completely got on the tank and been terrible for the Jays when they needed him most. So it's not him. I can't say a Red Sox, so that's the only reason I discount Mookie Betts is my own bias, even though he's been great for the best offense in the game. So I would even go with Altuve because I'm a little guy too, and I love the fact that little guys get 24 home runs and he's going to be the batting champion, although it would help if Houston was a little better, which means there's still going to be some votes for Mike Trout, boys, and I get the fact the Angels stink. But he's putting up amazing numbers again. He's number one in war. Uh, I think sometimes we get a little too um, convenient in saying, let's look for a first-place team with the best offensive player, i.e. Mookie Betts this year, you know, Donaldson right. a season ago. Trout shouldn't be discounted for the fact this team stinks. That's not his fault. He's having another sensational year. But ultimately, my picks would be Altuve and Bryant. Well, and then we appreciate it. I- I'm with you. I-, I think Brian is such a gift rep. I- I- Murphy is going to be right there next to him. Um, and, you know, I, I think it will go between Altuve and, uh, and Betts as well. But Big Poppy, of all people, I mean, he's having, you know, a great final hurrah. And, you know, he might even get a little bit of love. So uh, a ton of thanks for coming on. Hey, if Alex Cora wants to join us, he is more than welcome uh, to do so. We would love to have him on as well, and, uh, and hopefully we can have you on again, uh, too, in the future. So, guys, again, a lot of thanks to Adnan Vert. Follow him on Twitter at Adnan ESPN. Go to the ESPN app. Download uh, his Cinephile podcast. Give it a listen. Uh, follow him there. Uh, you know, just really uh, you know, appreciate what he's doing uh, and all the work. Obviously, you'll see him on ESPN Radio, on ESPN as well, Baseball Tonight, College Football, Saturday, et cetera. And then, again, thank you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Chris and I can't uh, give him enough right. appreciation, and we look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. All right. Thank you, Brendan. Chris, all the best with uh, your podcast, and I hope continued success uh, just as with mine, and uh, keep watching and loving baseball, this great game of ours. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Thanks. Mm Ed. Guys, another great episode of Out of Left Field. Thanks to Ed and Burke of ESPN again for joining us. We'll see you back next week with more stories straight out of left field.